Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a Star Trek podcast told through the lens of leadership development. And now, here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I am beyond excited for the episodes we're reviewing today. In some ways, this is the passing of the torch between the original series and the next generation. I'm talking about episodes 7 and 8 of the fifth season of TNG, Unification. This episode aired November 4th, 1991. Gene Roddenberry passed away on October 24th of that that same year. The episode begins with a simple title card commemorating him with the theme to the original series playing behind it. Well done, and rest in peace. Picard meets with Fleet Admiral Brackett in his ready room. She shows that Ambassador Spock, yeah, Spock, right? From the original series, here we go. But Spock is on Romulus, and they believe he may have defected, which would be absolutely devastating to Federation security. Now, back in the third season of The Next Generation, Picard shared a mind meld with Sarek, Spock's father. So this, this really hits him particularly hard. After this meeting, Picard confers with Riker as they head straight to Vulcan. Sarek is quite ill, so Picard is going to meet with his wife. Picard explains the the troubled relationship between Sarek and Spock, which which Riker understands well. And and we'll explore that, actually, more in the Season 2 episode, The Icarus Factor. Sometimes, fathers and sons. Understood. Long story short... Spock essentially sees Sarek as, well, as a colleague and and really doesn't hold him in any kind of regard as a father. We're going to learn a little more about this later on. Picard assigns Riker to investigate the remains of a Vulcan ship that were recovered from a Ferengi vessel. So far, I mean, we're just a little bit into this episode. We've got the Federation, we got the Vulcans, Romulans, and Ferengi. We're really branching out all across the galaxy. Picard meets with Perrin, Sarek's human wife, his third overall wife, and his second human wife, Amanda Grayson being the first human he married. Amanda, Amanda raised Spock and Michael Burnham. Perrin says that Spock wrapped up all of his affairs before he went to Romulus. He, He totally planned on going. And she goes on to explain the tension between Spock and Sarek, and she shares... But when the debates over the Cardassian War began, he attacked Sarek's position publicly. He showed no loyalty for his father. She also explains just, just how sick and ill Sarek is. Card asks to see him, and, and, and she reluctantly agrees, and that's really based only on the relationship between the two of them because of the mind meld they shared. Sarek, Sarek's in bad shape. He's speaking nonsense. He's rolling around restlessly on his bed. He just, he just looks tired and worn out. He comes to a state of lucidity. In silent lucidity. Once he recognizes Picard, and he shares that at the Kittimer conferences, Spock met Senator Pardek, a, a Romulan senator. Over the years, the, the, the decades, really, 80, 80 some odd years, they had connected, and Sarek believes that Spock has gone to Romulus to, to meet up with and to see him. As quickly as he became lucid, he slips out of it again. Picard helps him back to his bed, and, and, and Sarek says that he secretly admired his son this whole time, especially his courage. The two share a, a very touching moment. Peace and your own life. We have a lot of men. And they're from and... If you've ever experienced this decline with with a loved one, this this was a really well done and honestly very hard to watch scene. Back on Enterprise, Picard is attempting to get in touch with Gowron. Glory to you and your house. 
chancellor of the Klingon High Council. You see, Picard was instrumental in getting Gowron into that position. After trying to reach him for three days, they're contacted by a junior adjutant to the diplomatic delegation. Assistant to the regional manager. Same thing. Oof, this is a serious insult. Picard attempts to negotiate for access to a ship with a cloaking device, but the adjutant just isn't hearing it. So Picard shifts tactics masterfully and ends up getting access to the ship. You see, Picard has the luxury of representing a galactic superpower. That's not something all of us have in our organizations, right? But we do, though, re regardless of what level either we're at or our organization is at, to, well, I'll throw our weight around a little bit. I call it, I call it swinging a hammer. Something heavy that can be very effective in you know, driving the nail in what you need, but, but it also runs the risk of destroying whatever is in range of your swing. So keep in mind, swinging the hammer should never, never be your first course of action. In this segment, Picard swings the Federation hammer gracefully. He basically threatens Gowron that they will support another great house if he doesn't come through for them. The only benefit to the Klingon Empire would be our gratitude. Please add that if he is unable to provide us with a ship, then I am sure there are others in the Klingon Empire who would be willing to help me. And then they would have our gratitude. Now that might be kind of hard for a lot of us to, to compare to our daily lives. So I'll share an experience I had, a, a sort of similar situation that I had once before that you might be able to better relate to. The program that I was leading at the time was providing a service that was above and beyond what we were asked to do. You see, we were highly efficient in our standard work, and that was, that was because we applied lean principles. We eliminated wasteful, non-value-added steps in all of our processes. And this allowed us to provide a higher level of service than was expected. Well, that is, until a new government regulation changed, well, almost all the rules for us. Now, we have all these additional non-value-added steps that we can't eliminate because they're required by law. We call those uh, non-value-added but necessary steps. And I tell you what. Those are my absolute least favorite steps. It's just we're putting new cover sheets on all the TPS reports before they go out now. So if you could go ahead and try to remember to do that from now on, that'd be great. All right. Because of these, we had to scale back what we were providing. Now, a change at the executive level to our compensation structure would have given us the resources to continue the high level of service. But oof, that's, that was a tall, tall ask. So after my more delicate approaches failed, much like Picard, I looked for my hammer. See, I'd learned that this extra bit we were providing had come to be relied on internally by a few other programs. That knowledge gave me the hammer I was looking for. If you don't change our funding and compensation structure, it'll cost these three other programs X amount of dollars extra to do the things they need to do. Tell you what, I'm going to eliminate these extra steps in a week to comply with the new regulations, unless we have the new resources we need. You see, my choices were really to A, comply with the new regs and try to continue providing superior service somehow, B, comply with the new regs and degrade our service, or C, just not comply with the regulations. I think most people like me would want to do a right but but i had to convince others to make that happen so you have to know the work understand the impacts of the work both upstream and downstream and then then you can leverage that into into a value statement like i did just a few minutes ago or a few seconds ago you know so masterfully then you kind of wait on the decision ultimately in in this case it was somebody else's call but I had to do everything I could to do what, what I believed was right. So maybe, maybe it's not so much swinging a hammer as it is providing the right value statement. But either way, you need to be sure the decision makers have all the information necessary to make their decision. And knowing those impacts up and downstream is critical information. And once again, remember that swinging a hammer can break things too. And this should be used as a last resort. 
And Picard here did essentially the same thing. Right now, Gowron... Glory to you and your house. ...is enjoying the support of the Federation. His failure to reciprocate that support will result in the Federation backing someone else. Picard has the grace to call this gratitude, but the message, the implication, is crystal clear. During this negotiation, Data confirms Spock was meeting with Pardek from photos that were sent from long-range sensors. Enhance. 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 He's determined what district they're in, the Crocton segment, and, and he's also figured out Pardek's regular kind of daily schedule. Dr. Crusher is working with a small team to make prosthetics for Picard and Data so they can pass as Romulans. Riker calls him down to the cargo bay for an update on the Vulcan ship when they're, when they're able to make it down. Jordy has identified the remains of a navigational deflector array in the wreckage. He confirms that it came from a, a Vulcan vessel, the Tapau, which, which was decommissioned and sent to a surplus depot years ago. Also, this is a super cool throwback. If you remember, if you're a longtime viewer, Tapau was the name of the priestess presiding over Spock's presumptive wedding in a mock time. That's one. That's one I'm really looking forward to watching. Now, all the records indicate that the Tapau should still be in the, sur the surplus depot. Worf hails and informs Picard that a bird of prey, compliments of Gowron, Glory to you and your house has just arrived. Well played, Picard. He and Data prepare to beam over as Riker and the Enterprise head off to Quaylor 2 to investigate the depot. On the Bird of Prey, Captain Kavada is welcoming them. It may not be what you're used to on a Starfleet ship. Quite nice, thank you. Captain Kavada, is this the captain's quarters or my own? Both. We have limited space. We are a military ship, not a pleasure craft. Of course, this will be fine. They are to take their meals with the Klingons, and they will live as the crew does. Oh yeah, and they don't make any human food, just Klingon. Now Picard, Picard leans into it. He makes it sound as if his, this is just the way he would prefer it. Oh, what a great example from Picard here. How often are you given an assignment or, or conditions on assignment that are, that are just awful? Hey, I, I need you to save the world, and I need it done by next Tuesday. Oh, and there are some security concerns, so, so I'm going to need you to work in a locked room with a paper ledger and a calculator. Okay, may, maybe that was a ridiculous example. Maybe, maybe, though, it might be something a little more like, We've had a shift in the budget cycle, and we need some help to get us through Q4. It's going to be rough, but we need a 2% up in our year-to-year -year margins. And, yeah, we're going to need it by the end of the month. Yikes, right? Instead of arguing a losing battle or justifying your current state, just lean into it. Absolutely, you'd say. We've been waiting for a challenge just like this. Then, of course, you have to figure out how to do it, which might not turn out as well, but, but, but it might be a lot easier to get any needed support if you start off from a place of possibility instead of a place of defending impossibility. We'll see how this turns out for Picard here shortly. Riker and the Enterprise arrive at the depot. They communicate with Klim Dakachin, who is the consummate bureaucrat. Riker is, is offended, but, but Troy suggests a, a change in tactics. He's king of his particular hill, Commander. You'll have to treat him that way. Riker invites him onto the ship. He's impressed with the condition of it. Troy works with him and helps convince him to help out. There are two ways, two ways really, to look at this exchange. The first is that Riker is playing to strengths and having Troy work with Da Kachin because she's friendly and is able to gently convince people to help out where they normally may not want to. And then there's the other way where, where Riker is taking advantage of a coworker's physical appearance to encourage, well, frankly, a minor quid pro quo. Despite the evidence to the contrary, he probably figures that we don't get to see a lot of handsome women out this way. 
and someone like you might get a little more cooperation from me. He's probably right. I'm going to assume positive intent here. I'm going to go with the first. As a manager, you assign people to accomplish tasks, to, to do work. As a leader, you do so with an eye towards highlighting strengths and developing people's weaknesses. Riker here quickly acknowledges that he is not the right person for this job. He's, he's too to the point uh, for, for so, somebody so mired in, in bureaucracy. Troy, though... Troy understands how to make a person like this feel important and to help them feel like they want to help. So recognizing his weakness and recognizing her strength, he steps out of the way and lets Troy work her magic. And magic it is. He locates the ship and they head to it. And it's God. I'm not accustomed to losing things, Commander. I will find your ship for you. They they follow some clues and they find another ship, the Tripoli, missing. Now this is a ship the depot regularly beams materiel onto. So they see an opportunity. They go silent running to watch for the next scheduled beam over to see what happens. It's a galaxy class stakeout. Meanwhile, on the Klingon ship, Data says he doesn't require sleep, or does not require sleep, and will stand while Picard attempts to get some rest. Remember when I said we'd see how leaning in worked out for Picard? Well, here we see it didn't work out too well. And just watching him lay there is uncomfortable. That bed is terrible. Such an incredible back and forth between him and Data. Picard is a little well, creeped out. He's, he's just standing there, apparently cataloging, reviewing, and analyzing data around the Romulans so he can you know, better impersonate one. What are you looking at? I'm not looking at anything, sir. I'm continuing to organize my files. But you were looking at me. I am sorry if I was disturbing you, sir. I will not look in your direction. But still, it's hilarious to watch. Finally, Picard gives up. They review the data together until Kavada calls him up and shares a communication came through stating that, well, that Sarek has died. A small, highly armed combat vessel shows up, positions itself where the Tripoli would have been. It is full of cargo, mostly, mostly weaponry. They intercept the package meant for the Tripoli, and Riker tries to hail. They fire on the Enterprise, and in the return fire, they're destroyed. Worf was just targeting their weapon systems, but the cargo in it was so volatile, exploded, taking the ship with it. Looks like they've hit a dead end in their investigation. Back on the Klingon ship, Picard and Data have their Romulan makeup on. It looks good. It's, it's weird though, seeing Data with, with, with normal eyes and seeing Picard with a full head of black hair. Picard shares his feelings about Sarek's death with Data. He's really apprehensive about now needing to share this news with Spock in addition to their original mission. Data comments on the tension between Spock and Sarek. He offers a real commentary on, on human interaction. We have just a limited time to live, and Data finds it discouraging that people can't resolve their differences in that, in that short time. <laughs> The tone changes quickly, though, as Kavada starts hassling them about their prosthetics. Don't you two look sweet? He clarifies that his orders do not include rescue missions as he beams them to the surface. We see Senator Pardek meeting with Proconsul Neral. He asks Pardek if he knows Picard, showing him a picture on an early 90s prototype of the colorful iMac. Oh, and then there's the new iMac. Which is about as un-PC as you can get. Romulan security knows Picard is likely on the planet and is disguised as a Romulan. Data and Picard are walking through the streets. They have, they have some more fun back and forth between each other. Data, you're moving about in a very, well, android way. I am sorry, Captain. I will be more careful. Don't call me Captain. I understand, sir. They find a spot they believe they can reach out to Pardak from, but he's not there, so they head into a local diner. We get a glimpse of the culture here. The server is paranoid, very secretive. 
She all but accuses them of being spies for Romulan security. It'd be interesting to see what this would have looked like if the Tal Shiar were already a part of this universe. The two attempt to enjoy their soup, but Data sees Pardek. As they go to meet him, two Romulan security officers cut them off and arrest them. They're taken into a cave where Pardek is waiting for them. The security officers were in disguise. It was all a ruse just to get them off the street. From the shadows, we hear a voice, and that voice reveals itself as Spock. You have found him, Captain Picard. And that's the end of part one. <laughs> what? What? I, no, I need more. I can't. I can't wait a whole week for the next episode. I, oh, oh, hey, wait. <laughs> it's not 1991. I don't have to. Part two kicks off with a direct continuation of part one. Spock and Picard are discussing why they're on Romulus. Spock is adamant that this is none of Starfleet's business and that he's on a mission of peace. We're on a mission from God. Picard keeps pushing. He will not accept Spock just pushing him away. He drops the great respect for all that you've achieved on behalf of the Federation. Ugh, I hate that line. Like, it literally means the next thing I say to you will be mean and probably really insulting. I would love to hear somebody someday say, with all due respect, you do a great job and I really appreciate you. But that phrase has been so weaponized that even saying that, I, I feel like I'm passively aggressively trying to insult somebody. Well, when he's speaking, with all due respect, he calls this action cowboy diplomacy. Nice little seed here. We hear it again in face of the enemy when Spock calls on Picard for help. Picard, as a representative of Starfleet, says Spock must discuss the plan with him and not take any action without first consulting him. Spock replies with what I have so often either said or at least wanted to say to people when I want to do something. That is precisely what I had hoped to avoid. Like, just let me do the thing. I, I, know, I know this is for the best, and slowing down to tell you about it will, will best case, slow it everything down. But, but worst case, you're going to derail the whole plan. In reality, though, it's rarely, it's rarely a good thing to run off on your own and, and, and do something. Controls, governance, chain of command are generally there for a reason. It's when they're there just for the sake of having them that they become a problem. Identifying when there is or isn't a value add to this step, that, that's the key. As an example... Years ago, I was working in the public sector and I was directed to apply for a grant. After I wrote the grant application, I had to have it approved by my leadership. Once they approved it, I had to get it approved by their leadership. Once they approved it, I had to send it to our governing administrative agency to get their permission to send it to our legislature for approval. Whew. Now, it took me a month to write the grant. That's a very complex body of work. The approval process to get it to the state house took just over three months. And at no point in all of that were any changes recommended. It was immediately approved at each step. And as if that wasn't enough, this is, this is the real kicker. It went across to our Ways and Means Committee. That's the, the committee in the legislature that holds all the purse strings. They put about, gosh, 99% of all grants on what's called a consent calendar. And they just, they just wholesale approve the whole thing. So all those levels of review and approval for a blind rubber stamp. Now, of course, I, I assume that rubber stamp speaks to the faith they have in the internal reviews, but oh, that is one broken process. I can easily see two, three of the four layers of approval just, just, just being eliminated. And then imagine Spock, right? I imagine Spock has had so many similar experiences. And so here he, he just went straight to his solution. Now on the other side of the coin, here's an example of a value add. I worked for a large company doing some consulting. I found they were tracking their records inventory in an access database that one of their team members developed on their own. 
and they'd retired well, quite a while ago. <laughs> Yikes, right? So I recommended a records management system to them. They initiated the procurement process, and this company had IT governance in place. So any procurement request for software went through them first. They got our request and let us know the company already owned a system, and all they had to do was purchase more licenses. This saved a ton of money and a ton of time, and they got the solution as quickly as possible. Now, I don't think something the scale of Vulcan and Romulan reunification necessarily falls into that level of review in Starfleet, at least in Spock's experience. So once again, based on that, he goes straight for a solution. Picard chooses not to argue this with him. In fact, he takes a turn that I, I honestly found pretty shocking, jarring, really. Immediately after Spock says he wants to avoid the bureaucracy, Picard tells him about Sarek. He accepts the news stoically and walks with Picard into a private part of the cave. They talk about Sarek, and, and Spock essentially discounts much of what Picard shares. Emotional disarray was a symptom of the illness from which he suffered. Then Spock describes his mission. You see, there's been a growing movement of Romulans calling for reunification, but, but people tied to this movement have been declared enemies of the state. And Spock is here to protect them and to move the discussion with Pardek to the apparently sympathetic proconsul Neral. Picard asks bluntly, Why would you not bring something so important to the attention of your own people or the Federation? And Spock has a really interesting answer. He references the danger he put Captain Kirk and the Enterprise in when he committed them to the peace mission to support the Klingons as outlined in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. You, Captain Kirk, are to be our first olive branch. We have volunteered to rendezvous with the Klingon vessel which is bringing Chancellor Gorkon to Earth and to escort him safely through Federation space. Picard counters with an argument rooted in logic. Spock answers with his experience with cowboy diplomacy. He compares Picard to Kirk. In your own way, you are as stubborn as another captain of the Enterprise I once knew. And seems to agree, ultimately, to include Picard in his activities. Data on the Klingon ship asks Kavada for access to their computer so he can hack the Romulan info security net. Hide the planet! He also has a plan to piggyback Romulan signals to be able to communicate with the Enterprise. Kavada agrees to give him access as long as he shares any info that he gets on the Romulans with him. Data agrees and gets right to work. On Romulus, Spock and Picard are meeting in the open at what looks like a cafe. Spock is trying to convince Picard that all of this is a, is a, is a real possibility. Since you have a closed mind, Captain, closed minds have kept these two worlds apart for centuries. In the Federation, we have learned from experience to view the Romulans with distrust. We can either choose to live with that enmity or seek a way to change it. I choose the latter. A young Romulan, Detan, approaches them and shares an ancient book that tells the story of the Vulcan separation. Pardek comes up, shoes Detan off, and takes Picard and Spock to a more private location. Pardek talks about the generational shifts that have been occurring in society. Detan and the, the youth are, are no longer accepting the distrust and the hostility in their culture. He says that his generation, ultimately, will have no choice but to come into line with them. He goes on to say that meeting Spock, a real Vulcan, has inspired them to new levels. And then, then the big news, Neral has agreed to meet with Spock. What a huge step in his plan. Riker, continuing his investigation at Quaylor 2, finds himself in a seedy dive bar. He's looking for the former wife of the pilot of the ship they destroyed. Oh, he's all Riker in this. A new face. Same one I've always had. He's back and forth with the former wife, and she is she's great. She gives a little, not enough, and then, then she straight asks for a bribe. Riker reminds us that he lives in a post-scarcity society, and offers to jam with her instead. Move over. Oh, just what I need, another set of hands. Know this one? 20th century Earth. Maybe I could teach you a lick or two. Oh, you already have. She's into it, and let's loose that a fat Ferengi, 
Omag is the guy he wants to talk to, and that he'll probably be in the bar in a, in a few days. Great, great stuff from Riker here. I mean, this is, this is fantastic. Besides earning the reputation many of us know him for, he also teaches a valuable lesson here. When you don't have what somebody's asking for, offer something else that they would want. She wants cash, right? And Enterprise crew members are they're, they're too cool to have any of that. So after getting to know her a little bit, he takes a risk and offers something she thinks she'd still appreciate. And lucky for him, she's all about it and it pays off. Spock is meeting with Proconsul Neral. He's shocked at just how interested and sympathetic he seems to be to the cause of reunification. Forgive me, I did not expect to hear a Romulan proconsul speak like a member of your underground. They agree to meet and speak more, and Neral says he will publicly endorse the opening of talks between Romulans and Vulcans. Spock leaves, but does not appear to fully buy in to what just happened. And to put a point on that feeling, we see Commander Sella emerge from the closet having overheard everything. Sella's been screaming to tear apart the Federation and, and the Klingon Empire, actually, for quite some time. She praises Neral for his performance. In the caves, everybody's excited, but Picard and Spock are both still really skeptical. Spock says he intends to meet with the proconsul. He figures it'll, it'll still advance his mission of exploring paths to reunification. And he also tells Picard this is the most logical course, as he must see this through. If the Romulans have an ulterior motive, he believes this is the best way to learn what it is. And there's also the chance Neral is, is being honest, and this will be exactly the next step he and the Underground have been hoping for. The discussion devolves into another discussion of Spock and Sarek's relationship. Spock believes Picard is being influenced by his memories of Sarek, and Picard believes Spock is acting from emotion and not logic, just as Sarek believed for so long. Picard sticks to his message, though, and, and, and he owns his words as his own. In this, Spock has the self-awareness to see the irony in the fact that he is just now hearing his father but through Picard, and, and only after his father died. He acknowledges that he has brought his arguments with Sarek to Picard, and he's going to miss the arguments. Those arguments were all he had with his father. They head up to the Bird of Prey, and this leads to a scene that we Star Trek fans had been waiting for since TNG first aired. Spock and Data working and talking together. They discuss Picard almost as an allegory to the different paths the two have taken. Spock says there's an almost Vulcan quality to Picard, which honestly, it's, it's pretty hard to argue. But Data says that Picard has served as a role model of what it means to be human. Well, yeah, that's also hard to argue. They dive into and discuss their personal goals. Spock to be more Vulcan and Data to be more human. You are half human. Yes. Yet you have chosen a Vulcan way of life. I have. In effect, you have abandoned what I have sought all my life. This is a short but, but really satisfying exchange. While they're discussing this, they're also working on breaking the Romulan encryption, and they're successful. Back in the dive bar, Worf gets the piano player to sing Melota of Klingon opera. Man, Worf is really something else here. He ends up in a weird, weird place. Opa, melota, melota, melota. That's put to a quick end as a fat Ferengi comes in and demands that his song is played. That brings Riker back to the bar. Omag is cracking jokes. He's not taking Riker seriously at all. Big mistake as Riker gets in Omag's face and strong arms his way to information. He sends them to Galorndon Core near the neutral zone. Through Spock and Data's work, they're able to communicate to and, and then get an update from Picard, and then they head off towards the neutral zone. Spock's on his way to the proconsul's office to continue his talks, but is interrupted by Detan. 
Datan shares some children's toys that teach the Vulcan language. He says many generations of his family have used these as they've wanted to reconnect with their Vulcan cousins. Intelligence picked up by Data shows that Neral has been deceiving Spock. There's a code in a transmission that gave info on, in the time of, a subspace transmission where Spock was going to announce the talks between the two peoples and Neral was going to endorse them. The intelligence shows that he was leaking the information to stolen Vulcan ships near Galorndon Core. As they discuss and further question the intelligence gathered, Sela and her crew of security officers arrive and detain them. This furthers and confirms Spock's realization that they've been deceived, this time though, by none other than Senator Pardek. He runs down the actions Pardek had taken, and he shows that he was the only one with both the means and the motivation to do all of this. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal! Then, in classic Bond villain fashion, Sela tells him the whole plan. See, reunification will still happen, but not through the diplomatic or peaceful means Spock was working through. No, no, they will reunify through the Romulan conquest of the planet Vulcan. <laughs> Sella's taken the group back to the proconsul's office. She, conti- she continues the Bond villaining. She writes a speech for Spock, saying she enjoys writing, but doesn't get to do it much in her current job. Perhaps she would be happier in another job. Spock is going to communicate, per her speech, that a peace envoy of three Vulcan ships is on its way to Vulcan. That envoy will, in fact, be an invasion force. The Vulcans will welcome them with open arms, allowing for a quick victory in trenching the Romulan forces. Spock straight up refuses to read the statement. I will not read this or any other statement. So Sela shows a hologram they've programmed to do it without him. Looks like Spock was deep faked out of a job. The office has been set up with holoprojectors to handle all of this. She heads out, locking them in the office to launch the Peace Envoy. Data and Spock get to work to create a diversion. Her plan seems to be working. Enterprise picks up the Vulcan ships heading across the neutral zone and making their way to Vulcan. Riker's very skeptical about what's going on, so he orders the Enterprise to intercept. Back on Romulus, Sela returns to her office and finds two Enterprise security officers and Riker, with too much conditioner in his hair, waiting for them. He shoots at them and it, well, it turns out they're holograms. Spock emerges from behind a holographic wall. He nerve pinches one of Sela's guards while Picard punches the other one in the face. Spock gets Sela to stand down. Cowboy diplomacy. And Picard praises Data's holographic work. Oh, well done, Mr. Data. So... I don't think you got Commander Riker's hair quite right. Sella, though, is overly confident, saying the plan is in motion. There's nothing that can be done to stop it. (laughs) And to immediately confirm that, Enterprise picks up a message coming from Romulus. It's Spock, or hologram Spock, based on the speech. No, wait, no, it's... It's the real Spock. He's going off script. He's warning of the invasion force. They're 14 minutes out from the Vulcan ships, the invasion force, so they hit warp 8. On Romulus, Data explains he's disabled security. He's cleared a path for their escape. To get moving, he nerve pinches Sela, who drops to the ground. Not bad. Enterprise sees the Romulan force retreating back to the neutral zone, except one warbird that uncloaks. It blasts the Vulcan ships, destroying them. The bridge crew is stunned near silence. They just watched over 2,000 Romulan troops get killed by their own military. They destroyed their own invasion force. Rather than let them be taken prisoner. Detan leads Picard, Data, and Spock to a location that Pardek isn't aware of. They say they will do what they've always done. They'll teach and pass the ideas down to each generation, hoping that that one day they can have reunification. Spock tells Picard that that he's going to be staying. He will continue his mission. He sees more than ever that he's needed on Romulus. 
He says it may take decades or even centuries, but he must invest the time now. He then acknowledges Sarek's role as a father and that their arguments were helpful, just, just as his arguments with Picard were. Spock expresses regret that Picard likely knows Sarek more than he does. So Picard, in selfless generosity, offers to mind meld with Spock to share what he has of Sarek. My father and I never chose to meld. I offer you the chance to touch what he shared with me. The episode ends with Spock feeling the loss of his father, mind melding with Picard, as Picard softly cries. <coughs> oh, this was, this was so good. Like I said, these came out in November of 91, just a few weeks before Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, was released in theaters. As a young man in my early high school days, I remember the ramp up to these episodes well. I mean, Spock, right? Spock was going to be on TNG. This was the stuff of nerd dreams. Nerd! Nerd! And then, well, then it kind of wasn't. I mean, at first. I remember watching this when it first aired on KPTV out of Portland, Oregon, anxiously awaiting my hero's arrival. And I waited and waited. And then in the last 10 seconds of the first episode, he walks out and fade to credits. (laughs) What? Are you kidding me? Just a week later, we were all relieved and treated to an episode that featured Spock well and frequently. But back then, back then, a week was an eternity. They did a couple of small things in this episode to tie TNG to Star Trek VI. Sarek references the Kittimer Conference from 2293. This conference was the climax of the movie and a place that, additionally, ties Deep Space Nine into the conversation, as Curzon Dax was there too. Curzon was Dax's host before Jadzia. Oh, and and Worf's grandfather was there too. Pretty cool confluence of individuals. Spock, when defending his cowboy diplomacy, references the peace mission he roped Kirk and the Enterprise into. Again, straight from Star Trek VI. These were cool moments of continuity, not just because they connect the two series, but also because, in real life, the movie hadn't come out yet. So this gave a tiny preview, without giving anything away for for those of us that were eager to see the film and it shows foresight and coordination between the two vehicles something we're finally seeing more of in trek but was missing for much of its 90s run a little more obscure seed was planted in this episode as well while Detan, the young romulan whose parents taught him the vulcan language is a prominent figure in a lot of the non-canon star trek material out there He's referenced in a number of novels, and most remarkably, at least for me, is his pivotal role in the epic online role-playing game, Star Trek Online. Spoiler alert if you haven't played the game, but in the game, during the Romulan War arc, Detan becomes proconsul of the Republic and joins an alliance with the Federation and Klingons. It's pretty cool. In fact, it took me a moment to make the tie. I heard his name, and I'm like, oh, I know that name. It sounds so familiar. And then it hit me. Those STO writers have done an incredible job pulling from the various series and advancing the storylines. If you don't play, I highly recommend giving it a shot. It's free and totally worth at least checking out. Mark Leonard is so great as Sarek. He always has been. He inhabits the character and is so natural in the role. He plays with relative ease the plight and pain of someone that is aware of their mental decline. I think it's a real shame he died off screen and was only mentioned in a communication to Picard. Now, this is our first episode with Sela, even though I think it's her last episode in Star Trek. Man, I love Sela. Her very existence is a super Star Trek thing, but but I won't get into all that now. We'll see her a few more times in our look at TNG. I will say, though, and I know this might fire some people up, but this is one of the many reasons I'm glad and Spoiler alert, again, if you haven't watched Through the Next Generation, but one of the many reasons I'm glad Tasha Yar died. I just think I just think she was a terrible character. Worse than Neelix, really, but, but she didn't last long enough to rival his ranking in my book. But with Sela, Denise Crosby gets to rock it. 
She gets to bite into a deep, complex character and is absolutely amazing. This was fun too, because we got to see the Klingons pulled in and one of Star Trek's attempts at a Star Wars type atmosphere. That bar Riker ends up in was kind of like if somebody described the cantina in Star Wars to a fourth grader and then asked them to replicate it. Not bad, but yeah, not that great either. I did, I did really enjoy the musician though. She was a lot of fun. She had a great personality and really gave Riker a chance to shine. The way Picard pulled the Klingons in was fun, but so was their response. Putting him and Data in a single room with, with a shelf to sleep on. <laughs> I love the scene when Picard was trying to sleep. The stuff with Data here was just, was just golden. There was this kind of weird theme though, watching the episode when people were talking about big, important stuff. They'd just be looking off into the distance at nothing in particular. It was pretty distracting, really, especially like at the very start with the Admiral and later on with Captain Cavada. I'm sure it was supposed to import something, but it just came across, I don't know, weird. Every now and then, Star Trek goes big and epic, and this was one of those times. While the pacing, in my opinion, made it feel, I don't know, maybe a little smaller than it could have been, it still felt like it had galaxy-wide implications. A fun, mostly really well-done set of episodes that echo Star Trek VI very well and set up future events in other Star Trek series. Command codes verified. While this was a great episode, essential Star Trek really, there was surprisingly, disappointingly little leadership occurring here. We are, though, going to take a close look at about four people here. Picard and Riker, of course, but also Spock and Pardak and Neral. Okay, Picard, in addition to the pieces we discussed earlier, knowing how and when to swing a hammer and leaning into difficult and unpleasant situations, demonstrates through both episodes what it looks like to put the mission ahead of himself. He's in danger as soon as he crosses into the neutral zone and is met with a Spock that is not willing to comply with Starfleet. He persists, putting himself in, in, in more danger by walking openly through the streets, well, openly in disguise, but interacting with Romulans he's never met before. He understands the mission. He understands how critical it is to the Federation, and he never, never backs down from it. When Spock offers him nothing more than resistance, he remains persistent. Even when he doesn't get the agreement he was wanting, even expecting, he continues and ends up with a compromise that works out well for all involved. By sticking to the mission and accepting Spock's compromise as, as, as being better than just getting shut out of participating, he's able to connect him to Data, and the two of them are able to accomplish amazing things. In fact, that's the ultimate value add Picard offers here. Getting out of the way and enabling experts to do what they can, he connects with and ultimately manages Spock and then lets him do his thing. I think we can all learn a valuable lesson here. And for some, honestly, this might be a difficult lesson to learn. Picard's goal here isn't to solve the problem himself, but to determine what Spock is doing on Romulus and to proceed in the best interests of the Federation. There's a version of all that where he tries to do this himself, where he tries to be the hero. But when we see what it takes just to open communications on top of the Romulan signals, it's clear he would have completely failed. Instead, he gets out of the way and enables others to be the heroes. When do you handle a problem when there is likely someone else on your team that should be handling it, that would arguably be better than you at handling it? Or when does a member of your team present an idea and you immediately look for an opportunity to involve yourself? Personally, I have seen this countless times. I'll be in a meeting and, and, and some other person presents an idea or a report that their staff did. Often, they even go so far as to claim or at least imply the idea was their own or just not offer that it came from their team. When they're questioned or pushed on it, they eventually start answering with things like, good question, I'll confer with so-and-so and then get back to you. Now, if they're giving an executive report out on something, that's one thing. But if they're going to be asked specific questions and people are expecting answers, why didn't they at least bring their staff person with them? Why not share the glory 
and give this staff person a chance to shine in front of the executive team. At the very least, have them there to answer questions. Bottom line is the leader in this case chose to take the spotlight when it could have been shared. But why? Well, here's the answer and the tough pill to swallow. That leader is insecure and is afraid that sharing that spotlight will diminish their value. The reality is, though, that while the spotlight is being shared, it shines equally on both people, the staff person for, for doing well, and the leader for developing and highlighting the talent on their team. In most organizations, leaders and managers are in their positions to lead and manage, not to be a subject matter expert. That's for the staff. So do like Picard does. Connect to people. Manage expectations. Counsel. Advise. Remove barriers. Enable people. And then get out of the way. Another spoiler alert here. Maybe the last one. But as we learn in Season 3 of Discovery, all of this eventually pays off. We talked about Riker managing to strengths and not objectifying members of his team at all or in, or in any way. But another great thing he does that, that I want to dive into a little more is when he's negotiating with the piano player, Amory, in the, in the dive bar. At one point, she asks for a bribe for info. Not having any money, he opts to jam with her instead, remember? She really enjoys it and ultimately shares the information. What this teaches us is that the thing someone says they want is not necessarily the thing they actually want or, or the only thing they want. Specifically, this makes me think of motivating your teams and your staff. How quick are we to look at salary increases or cash bonuses as methods of motivating or rewarding staff? This has been a go-to for, well, just about as long as we've paid people to do work. But is it effective? Well, just look at your employee engagement metrics to answer that question. And if you don't have those, just duck, duck, go employee engagement rates. Or even better, I'll save you the time. They're generally not great. But how can they be not great when we offer them more money? Well, the thing is, money isn't what they really want. Most people want things like recognition, privileges, opportunities, and, and I think more than anything, meaningful tasks and work. Riker knew this. He could have easily told Amory to hold on while he returned to the ship, replicated some cash, and dropped it in her cup. Instead, he knew that she valued experiences and diverse music, so he gave her exactly that. In the post-scarcity society that Riker lives in, that may have been more of a matter of convenience. But for us, where we most certainly do not live in a post-scarcity society, this differentiation is much more practical. You can choose to throw money at your staff and hope for increases in productivity and profitability. Or you can actively work on their engagement, which rarely, rarely means money. That is, unless they aren't being compensated fairly or competitively. That's, that's kind of an even before step one sort of thing. But this usually means you engaging with them to determine what motivates them. It's like Seattle Seahawks coach Pete Carroll once said, I spend 98% of my day sitting in my office and thinking about what I can do to get my team to play just 1% better. And this brings us to Spock. In other episodes of the Starfleet Leadership Academy, I praised him as a highly effective executive officer. I honestly don't know that I can say the same of him here. These episodes came out just a few weeks before Star Trek VI, as I've said, and that was where the Federation began its path to peace with the Klingons. This story echoes that with the Romulans. In the movie, Spock uses a crisis, the explosion of the Klingon moon, Praxis, to bring the Federation Council together and embark on a peace mission. Last month, at the behest of the Vulcan ambassador, I opened a dialogue with Gorkin, Chancellor of the Klingon High Council. He proposes to commence negotiations at once. In unification, he unilaterally decides to do this and he heads out on his own. Bluntly, this wasn't his choice to make. I mean, is the Federation a massive bureaucracy that probably would not have seen things the same way he did? Well, yeah, absolutely. But that 
doesn't justify his approach, his, his cowboy diplomacy. When Admiral Brackett first talks to Picard, they're thinking defection. I mean, they're preparing a security response. The point, and, and, it, and, it, and it kills me to say this, but the point is that you have to work in the system to change the system. It kills me because, because I so identify with Spock here. I cannot abide massive bureaucracy. I have zero patience for it. But I've also learned that you can work within it. You have to have clear vision. You have to be persuasive and push the fringes of the edges of acceptable behavior. But that's how you have to do it. As of the time I'm recording this, there's very little follow-up on this storyline. We already talked about one, Face of the Enemy, and the other comes in the third season of Discovery. But what those lead us to believe is that Spock has been doing this work mostly in a vacuum. Little to no support from the Federation or the Vulcans. Had he worked from within the system, yes, absolutely, it would have taken longer to get started. But, arguably, it could have been so much more effective. All that being said, his vision and his courage were enviable. He believes unequivocally that reunification is not only possible, but inevitable. He has long-term vision. He talks in terms of decades and centuries, but he has supreme confidence in the outcome. It would be inspiring and exciting to work with someone like this. Finally, I want to talk a little about Pardek and Neral. Well, and even Sela. Why, you ask? Well, because they also show some leadership traits here. Specifically traits that I recommend you avoid. They also have a vision. The military conquest of Vulcan and then, likely, war with the Federation. Vision's great, and, and maybe that vision is culturally appropriate for them. But it's how they execute that vision that is problematic. Lies, deception, and trickery. Between Neral working to convince Spock that he believed in reunification and Pardak's long-term con of Spock, I felt like I was watching an episode of House of Cards. They're telling people what they want to hear just to get them to behave in a way that advances their own purposes and goals. They actually have the intention of disposing of these people when they're no longer useful. Have you seen this in the workplace or something like it? <sighs> I sure have. Dangling promotions in front of people to get them to take on assignments or, or even to take accountability for things they shouldn't need to. Building someone up so they apply for a position outside of your program so you don't have to deal with them anymore. I'm sure you can think of plenty of examples here too. Using and taking advantage of people in a clearly dishonest way to advance your own goals is, is sad, pathetic, and it's a trait of a poor and likely very insecure and incompetent leader. I bring Sela into this because, yeah, she shares that same vision, but she never pretends to be anything she isn't. She uses Neural and Pardek, but they know what's going on. While she's the real big bad in this story, I suppose I have to give her credit for authenticity. I mean, that's something, right? I hate Vulcans. I hate the logic. I hate the arrogance. Very well. Let me know what you thought of these episodes. Did you see them when they first aired too? Were you, were you as upset as I was when Spock was barely in the first part? What examples do you have of people using deception and trickery to work their way through the workplace? Tell me all about it. I'm on all the social media at Jeff T. Aiken. Jeff T as in Tripoli. A-K-I-N. And it would be mighty cool of you to tell a friend or a colleague about the Starfleet Leadership Academy. I'd appreciate it a lot. Now, let's look and see what we are going to watch next time. Working. Looks like we're sticking around with some more of The Next Generation. Season 3, Episode 8. The Price. This features some really cool seed planting for a cool episode of Voyager, but, but we'll get to that one another time. So until then, ex astra scientia. <laughs> <laughs>